And then gradually, again, this traditional discourse, uh, began to die off in the 1990s until, and largely because of uh, Pope John Paul II and, um, and Colonel Ratzinger, who's now the Pope, was, is dead. I'd like to argue that that genealogy is wrong on both sides, both in terms of where liberation theology starts and the fact that it's really not dead. Um, I'd like to think really about both liberation theology and contemporary Latin American hip hop as contemporary manifestations of something that's really much, much older. It's ways that Latin Americans have used culture, religion, and art to think about social justice. And that's something that goes back a long, long way. We can talk about anybody like Pope, uh, the leader of the Pueblo Revolt in, uh, in 1680. We can talk about Tupac Amaru. We can talk about Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz, Puerto de las Casas. Since the, the conquest of the Americas, the ways that both Latinos, uh, mestizos, and indigenous peoples, and black people who were brought here as slaves, thought about peace, justice in Latin America has been through culture and the arts. So that's different than a lot of the interpretations of, of the way that we think about liberation theology. I would much prefer to trace liberation theology back to uh, somebody like Sor Juana or Bartolome de las Casas, people who were uh, religious figures in the 17th century in Mexico, than I would to those famous Catholic Marxist dialogues in France. So, why is it then, if the origin of liberation theology isn't really what everybody thinks it is, that also liberation theology isn't dead yet? And I think that for that you have to look at contemporary Latin America. You can't imagine contemporary Latin America without liberation theology. You can't imagine, for instance, the, uh, the government of Lula in Brazil without understanding that a lot of the basis of that thought and the motivations for the people that got him elected are that. The new president of, uh, of Paraguay is in fact a bishop who was involved with liberation theology, had to leave the church in order to become president. Uh, Evo Morales, uh, Correa in Ecuador, the FMLN, which just won the elections in El Salvador, all of these has as their basis liberation theology. Also, Brazilian municipal governments. Uh, I was just at a, at a conference in Berlin about issues around governance, and that's the hot topic in Latin America, in, in uh, political studies these days, is how is it that you can have participatory democracy, which comes out of Brazilian municipal governments, which comes out of liberation theology. And finally, what I want to suggest is that hip hop serves to a certain degree as a continuation of the logic of liberation theology in Latin America. Remember very clearly uh, a, a kid who I was talking to in, in Recife, a city in northeastern Brazil, who's a great breakdancer. But he said, you know, breakdancing, breakdancing isn't what you've got to do in order to be a great dancer. Being a great breakdancer isn't about your steps. Being a great breakdancer is about respeito, solidaridade, e humildade. Respect, solidarity, and humility. Sort of an interesting way to define what's a good dancer, and gives me a little bit of relief, because I can't dance, but I can at least do respect. Right? Um, it's, it, it's interesting to, to think about those values in terms of the, the inheritance of, of religious thought in Latin America. Uh, respect is something that we can understand very well as the, the Hebrew concept of hesed. It's loving kindness. It's the way that one is to relate to other people. Solidaridade, it's mishpat. It's the idea of justice. And finally, humility. It's a very, very Christian concept. So in spite of the fact that most people will want to put hip-hop into a different set of categories, within Latin America, the ideological basis for it, in spite of the fact that people who are, the, these kids who are doing this dancing are not going to have any sort of God talk around. That's not the way that they're going to talk about these things. Nonetheless, they are to a certain degree the inheritors of this sort of logic. So we're going to talk about, to begin with, uh, the concept of batalla and luta, battle and struggle. In, in liberation theology, everything was a struggle. In Spanish lucha, in, in Portuguese luta. We were struggling against the dictatorship, 
struggling against the rich, struggling against the United States, but struggle was a, a central word to it. Now, in contrast, one of the most important things that happens within hip-hop in Latin America is the batalla, the break battle. Um, people who know something about hip-hop in the United States probably know something about the, uh, the, the genealogy of, of breakdance battles. But it's interesting that with, among these kids who are doing it in Brazil, they're very clear about where it comes from. So the way that it works is that you have one kid who stands on, on one side and begins by making a couple of steps. I'm not even going to attempt things because you'll just laugh at me. But who will begin making a couple of steps and then his opponent, who is over here, has to do something similar but make it better. They go back and forth and back and forth until somebody can, can get to the point of, of being at, okay, well, you know, you've just done three flips and a, uh, and, a, and a clown and this, and, you know, I just can't do that. And so there's how victory comes in, in this point of building upon what the other can do, challenging it, and modifying it. When you talk to these kids, and when I say kids, I'm not making some metaphor about kids when they're not 18 years old. We're, these are kids who are 12, 11 years old, but who've grown up within hip-hop and who've heard the stories of the beginning of break dancing in Brooklyn and the Bronx. And we're very clear about, okay, well, this is where it starts. It starts when you've got a gang war, and people are really concerned that they're killing each other. And so instead of fighting with knives, instead of fighting with guns, they invent dancing as a way to compete. Whether or not that's an accurate history of break dancing in the Bronx, I'm not entirely sure. I wasn't there. But what's important is that these kids who are in Brazil use that as the history of break dancing to understand what they're doing. Because they're involved in situations that are exactly that. That are of tremendous gang war. Uh, the, the community that, we were, that Hinta and I were working in, in Santo Amaro, maybe 10,000 people, a uh, relatively small community, but a place where every night there are two or three kids murdered. In some cases because of stray bullets, in some cases because of gang wars, in some cases because of deaths, but death is an absolute constant. If you look over the course of, of a weekend, there will be 10 or 15 kids that are murdered. When you're in that sort of a circumstance, and especially in a circumstance where you've got one neighborhood, which is four blocks by four blocks, really small, crack house there, then you've got another neighborhood, also four blocks by four blocks, <coughs> and some sort of a place where they're selling drugs. The gangs that control these points for drugs are in constant battles with each other. So that's the metaphor that the kids are talking about. If you've got that battle as what's going on in your life, and it's a battle where people are dying, how is it that you can transform that into a productive battle? Into a battle where I challenge you to do something, and that makes you better, and then you do something, and that makes me better. There's a, a really disturbing phenomenon in, in Recife, which are these, they're called funk gangs. Uh, funk in Brazil is... Um, developed out of American funk, but then took its own path. And what these funk gangs do is that, imagine that I'm a part of this community here, these four blocks. I'm a part of a gang that's ha that has its song. I have the challenge of going over into this neighborhood in the middle of the night. When I'm in this neighborhood, you're allowed to shoot me. Anybody's allowed to shoot me. But I sing my song which is going to be, I've come to your favela, I had the courage to do it, let's see if you can come to mine. And then I run back. And then, since I've challenged you, you have to come and you have to sing that same thing in my favela and I can kill you when you're there. And so this is another one of the causes of these deaths. It seems like a really strange ritual. And yet at the same time, it's central to the way that uh, identity and... Um, pleasure, even, is structured in the Brazilian favela. And so, when we think about this, this battle that's going on 
among the kids. It's a way of transforming the same dynamic of challenge and response, but turning it into something that's productive. Something that's really important in, the, uh, in this gang war is that we, there's a tendency to think about gang wars as if it's something that's uh, anarchic, that it's out of control, that it's the fault of poor people. But the truth of the matter is, if you look at what's really going on with gang wars, it's flows of international capital. Why is it that drug gangs in Rio de Janeiro are so tremendously powerful? Because in the late 1980s, as the United States began to cut off cocaine directly from Colombia to the United States, going through Rio and then going to New York became a really effective way of, of exporting cocaine. Then that creates a, a demand for cocaine among rich people in Rio de Janeiro who go into the favela, which they have constructed as a, as a sort of no man's land, in order to, uh, and use that space as a place to have the wars between, basically, different forms of global capital. It's illegal, criminal global capital, but it's global capital. I, I think that a lot of us know about the favelas in Brazil through movies like The City of God, um, and there's this sense that, you know, it's, it's because they're poor ignorant people, somehow. But that's not true at all. The truth of the matter is that these things are happening because of the purchase of cocaine, largely by Americans, but also by Europeans. So we have to think about these things in lots of ways. There is a flow of global capital and of cocaine that's, having, that's causing these battles within a city like, like Hesibi. But at the same time, you have a flow of culture that's gone from Africa through the Bronx to here to receive it as a way of resisting it. There are two really important things that are going on in this battle. The first one I've already talked about, which is the way that by ritualizing the battle, transforming the battle into a dance as opposed to something that's about guns, that it transforms war into peace. That, I think, is fundamental. But there's a second thing that goes on as well, which is that when this battle happens, it doesn't just happen in the favela. It doesn't just happen in the shanty town. It happens in public. It happens in spaces that other people occupy. So it's not just a matter of me and my friend getting together to battle back and forth. It is, in fact, us taking the encerado, the, the, the dance floor, the wax dance floor, and carrying it to the middle of the city. And there in the middle of the city is where we do the battle. We have the, the, beat, the, the box, the, uh, the dance floor, and we're doing it there. And why is it important that it happens in that particular space? Because the prejudice that the rich, generally white people of the center of the city have about what it means to be poor and black in these cities is that you know all of them are just criminals, all of them are worthless, all of them are gangbangers. But the moment that those kids come and they put that there and they have their battle in the middle of the city, it's not just that they're creating a new relationship between each other. They're creating a new relationship with the city itself. They're transforming the way that the city sees them. And by transforming the way that the city sees them, they transform the way that the city sees other people from the favela. So it's not just a question of making peace between this drug gang and this drug gang, but of making peace between the city itself and the favela, which is really important. One of the reasons that the drug gangs are so powerful is because they have this discourse of, we're defending you. It's not just that they've got guns. It, people can have guns. The problem is that they've got legitimacy. <coughs> that people come to them in order to solve problems. And the major problem that people have in the favela is the police invading. The police come in, beat people up, kill people, rape women, I mean, just what the worst things that you could possibly imagine. And the gang says, we're going to defend you. And so the fact that these kids, 11, 12-year-old kids, have put a dance floor somewhere in the middle of the city is a way for them to start thinking differently about establishing a different relationship between 
the margins and the center of the city. That's not just about fear on, the hand, on one hand and invasion on the other. Liberation theology had a very different idea of what struggle meant. It's not batalia, necessarily. It's much more about, they, the, the word was luta, it was struggle. Now, in fact, if you look at the dynamics of oppression and resistance in the 1960s and 1970s in Latin America, they were equally complicated. As, uh, as I was thinking about this talk uh, and, and talking about it with my wife, she was explaining to me what it was like in the 1960s and or 70s and, and 80s in being involved in grassroots youth movements that were involved in liberation theology and working on behalf of miners, for instance, uh, in the south of Brazil, who were being beaten up and killed by uh, local and, and global bosses and capital and businesses. And in fact, there was as much ambiguity about uh, who was on the right side, who was on the left side, on the, the, the wrong side, as we might find today. Nonetheless, the discourse was a much simpler discourse. It was, there are these bad guys, the bad guys being global capital, the United States, businesses, the rich, more or less. And then you have all the good guys, who are uh, blacks and indigenous peoples and the poor, and the, the distinction was, was there. And I think that what's been very interesting about what hip hop has brought to cultural movements in Latin America is that there's a much more sophisticated idea of the way that power works. That in fact, the, the people who may be the most oppressive to a community are, of course, it is global capital. It is people in New York and Philadelphia and, and Albuquerque, New Mexico buying cocaine. But it's also local people who are probably my friends from when I was a kid who have become the, the leaders of these drug gangs. And so the ambiguity of power and the way that power co-opts people who, you know, when I studied in kindergarten, in kindergarten with them, were really good people. But at the same time, now they're the ones who are killing my kids. Um, so that ambiguity, I think, is really important, the way that it's been brought out. The second thing that, that I think is, is really important in, in, the, in what hip-hop has brought to this discourse is theatricality, that staging of the struggle, the, the putting the stage in the middle of the city in which the break battle happens. And so what that does is that it, it changes things into spectacle, and it also changes things in the way that the relationships happen. The second development that I think is very important from the 60s to the 80s as we move from uh, social movements dominated by liberation theology to social movements more dominated by hip hop is the role of culture plays. Now, when I was in El Salvador at the beginning of the 1990s working with organizations doing liberation theology, uh, when Quito was uh, uh, involved in youth groups in Brazil in the 1980s, culture was immensely important. A guitar, folk songs, uh, dances, all of those things played a fundamental role in the way that um, in the way that social movements organize themselves. It is, after all, Latin America, where culture is tremendously important, where dance and music and song are things that bring people together. But I think that what happened with, within liberation theology is that those cultural issues were thought to be a medium. The end is social transformation. The end is spiritual, perhaps, but culture serves as a medium for that. And what happened with, with hip-hop is that instead of it being a medium for something else, <coughs> culture is not just a medium to get to justice, but culture becomes the end itself. It's not enough. There's a major difference in Brazil, for instance, between funk which is a great rhythm that brings people together and makes them dance together. But, at the same time, is also involved in all sorts of kinds of violence. Um, the lyrics of it often motivate violence that are, oh, this, this favela is the best one and don't you come. And contrasting that with hip-hop, which is also something that is involved with, with culture, with, uh, with hope, with joy, and which brings people together.
together, but at the same time, does it in a very positive way, which is reaching for something else. So I think that, that um, there's, a, there's a virtue in Latin America, and something that people are very conscious about, of how being together is one of the most important things that's possible. That one of the real, da that the dangers of capitalism and of contemporary oppression, sure, are that people are, um, that some people suffer and that some people benefit. That some people are oppressed and some people are oppressors. But another one of the, the problems with the structure of the contemporary economics and political structures is that people don't have a chance to get to know each other, that people don't come together. The, the, the very old Greek idea that man is a political animal, that man is an animal who, is, who enjoys coming together with other people, meeting new people, having the chance to look someone in the eye, whether that means flirting, whether that means uh, having a break battle, but to have human relations with people. And that to a great degree, the problems with the contemporary Latin American city have to do with the fact that there are walls. And it's really difficult to encounter other people. So hip hop and funk overcome that to a certain degree. They bring people together. The question is, what sort of relationships are developed in that culture? And I think that what's really interesting about, about hip hop is that it builds upon the insistence that it's not just coming together that's important. Coming together is great. It's great to overcome segregation. It's great to break down the walls between rich and poor. But you have to do it for an end. In hip hop, everybody is coming together in order to create some sort of justice. And that's, I think, the, the fundamental insight that there's a, a, an ambiguity there. Between, men, between means and end. That at the same time that people are tremendously excited about coming together, about relating to each other, they're also doing it for something in the end. One of the most interesting projects that we've done in Brazil uh, was a project called City of Rhyme. A group of these kids that I've been talking about who were doing the break dancing, break battles on the street um, had also begun to do some rapping. Rapping's different, of course, there are, there are, there are the four um, different things that happen within hip hop, the DJing, um, mm -hmm. graffiti, rap, and break dancing. And a lot of the kids had been compelled enough by break dancing that they wanted to start doing rap. And so Akita and I worked with a local music composer uh, and, and DJ in order to teach 15 of these kids the basics of music composition, they learned how to compose on the computer, uh, poetry so that they could write the lyrics, history so that they could understand the sort of the world in which they lived and could write songs about it, and then recording and performing. And over the course of three months, the kids wrote their own songs, composed their own songs on the computer, recorded them, and eventually uh, um, created both a, a CD and a, just a stunning concert in front of 5,000 people in the center of the city. It was an amazing event to have all of these kids who, from the margins, kids who had lived on the street, who worked on the street, uh, many of them break dancing in order to ask for spare change, but all of them coming together in order to write a hip hop album. And there were a couple of things that were really interesting. First of all, that a lot of people who are used to American, especially gangster rap, would not have recognized anything about this album. It was all denouncing violence. It wasn't uh, talking about how cool it is to have lots of money. In fact, it was talking about how awful it is that some people have lots of money and other people have none of it. It was talking about how, how rough it is to live in a place where anybody might die at any time. And then, the moment when you have a concert with 5,000 people in the center of the city, in a city that's so segregated, where most of the, the rich white people have never gone into one of the favelas, and many people from the favela go into the white areas of the city just to work, to have 
so many people come into the center of the city to listen to 12 and 13 year old boys and girls rap about their own experiences. That was magical. It's amazing. First of all, bringing people together, people who have been segregated. But secondly, bringing them together in order to transform the world. And think about the violence. And think about injustice. And also, to create a sort of social movement. Um, Hip-hop isn't marginal in a place like Kasifi. The, I guess it was two days later, after this, this show, uh, I went to the Brazilian Social Forum, which happened to be going on in the same city. And uh, the organization where a lot of these kids had worked put on the, the, the CD that the kids had recorded. Just as they were preparing for, a, for an event and put on the CD to, to bring people there. And two or three kids that I had never seen before, who I think were from the other side of the city from where the kids that I've worked with had been. Two days after this show, knew all the lyrics to one of the songs that one of the 14-year-olds had written. The way that that implies a social movement, the way that, um, that creating this rap album, first of all, made people think about violence. Secondly, made them think about violence in their own circumstances. And thirdly, <coughs> made them start to compose their own lyrics was fascinating. When I originally wrote this, um, this talk, I thought about concluding it with sort of a theological interpretation of hip-hop about the, way, the things that I've been talking about. And I'm actually going to talk about that. But I think that there's a certain hegemony in saying, oh, hip-hop is just a realization of some theological dream of liberation theology from the 1960s. That's not quite right. I think it's also possible to use the categories of hip-hop in order to understand liberation theology and, in fact, to understand the history of resistance in Latin America. Um, it could be a really interesting way to think about things, using ideas of, uh, about uh, self-help, um, the philosophy of hip-hop, and community development as a way to, to think about Tupac Amaru or, um, or Bartolo de las Casas. But today, largely because this is a, a talk that's, um, that's supported uh, by, the, by the theology department, I'm going to think a little bit theologically about hip-hop. Now, like I said, kids who are doing hip-hop in Brazil will talk to a certain degree theologically. Um, they're going to talk in very moral terms. They're not going to use the terminology that I'm using here. They're 12 years old. They're in a place where um, education is pretty bad. The, the school system in a city like Recife is appalling. At the same time, they found hip-hop as a really good way to express their, um, their moral insights. And to a certain degree, their insights about uh, ontology, about theology, about philosophy. And here I'd like to try to interpret a couple of those ideas in terms of more traditional theological categories. Uh, for some people, it may be useful. For others, it may not. For me, it's an interesting way of thinking. There is the tradition within, um, within Christian thought, going back to the, the Gospels, that the kingdom of God is within you. It's a phrase that either Jesus said or was attributed to Jesus. And what that means has been in debate for a long time. Uh, Tolstoy wrote a book called The Kingdom of God is Within You. Gandhi talks a lot about the phrase. But what I think is interesting about the idea of the kingdom of God is within you is that the kingdom of God is not something that happens after death. It's not even something that happens in a utopian future. When you read that phrase, especially through the letters of Paul, especially through the letter of the Romans, I think, you get the sense that what the kingdom of the God, uh, what the kingdom of God is, is the community that is struggling together to make the kingdom of God. So that's confusing. That the kingdom of God is something that already exists in the community that is struggling to make that happen. 
So the kingdom of God is justice. It is uh, some sort of utopian idea of people who could live together properly, uh, without oppression, without uh, injustice. But at the same time, we know that that's something that's in the future, that is real, that's going to be really difficult to achieve. At the same time, it's something that the, the seed of it exists, or a crystal of it exists, in the community that is struggling for that. So that's where I'm talking about this confusion between culture and a mean, as a means or culture as an end within hip-hop. Hip-hop's clearly struggling for a more just society. It's struggling for uh, a society in which 12-year-old kids are not killed by stray bullets and 14-year-old kids don't get enlisted as soldiers in gang armies. It's fighting for a world in which um, there aren't walls that divide rich white areas of the, of the city from poor black areas of the city. At the same time, you can't just conceive of hip-hop in terms of what it is reaching for. You also have to understand it in terms of what the movement itself is, which is, in fact, a non-racial movement in which utopia happens in that moment. The Brick Battle, where two kids, one of them can be white and one of them black, one of them rich, one of them poor, or both of them poor, that's not what matters. What matters is that when those kids are coming together and breaking with each other, or when kids come together to rap with each other, and I do the beatbox, and you do the, the lyrics for a while, and then my friend does the lyrics, and then somebody else does, that all of those are utopian moments. That those are moments where, in fact, the kingdom of God is within you. That the, the community that is struggling for the kingdom is itself the kingdom. In a certain way, we can see this as a sort of death of God theology. Uh, death of God theology was really hip in the 1970s and has largely and probably best been forgotten. But um, the idea of it was that you take really seriously the death of Christ on the cross. That he really died. And what happens when God dies? That you've got to build Christ, build God within the community. What happens there is that the transcendental, what is beyond, what is future, becomes inscribed on the quotidian, on the daily. And I think that to a certain degree, that's a really good way of thinking about what happened with hip-hop. Hip-hop isn't a religious movement. And if it were a religious movement, it probably wouldn't be anywhere near as successful as it is. But what it did is that it took those transcendental ideals about justice and peace and living together, they come out of liberation theology, and it insisted that it has to happen here and now in any particular moment. And it has to be fun when it happens. It has to be joyful. The God talk is gone, but the struggle and the spirit really continues. This is a very particular story of Latin American social movements over the last 40 years. Clearly, we can talk about it in other ways as well. But I think that if you look at what are the most creative things that have happened in Latin, Latin American social movements, what most can be taught to people who are working for justice in other regions, that creativity, that spark of change, really happened for a while within liberation theology and today within hip hop. And so thinking about the continuity between the two of them and how both of them express ways of using art and culture and religion and happiness, quite frankly, and joy to think through issues of justice and peace. I think it's useful. And I'm glad to have been able to, to speak with you a bit about it this afternoon, this evening. Um, and I'll be glad to take any questions. And please don't feel like the questions have to be theological at all. I'd be really glad to talk about very concrete stuff. Okay. Children are in the gangs? I still don't understand that part. Are they just like, let's make they're not in violence with the gangs? I don't know. Right. Um, drug gangs in Brazil begin with kids as young as eight years old. Uh, kids very often will start off being runners, will, will carry drugs from one place to another because the police don't suspect them as much. They'll often work also as uh, fogueteros, which means. Uh, 
people who sit at the entrance to the favelas with fireworks, and the moment that the police invade, they'll shoot the fireworks up so that everybody can get their guns ready to, to have a battle with the, the police. Gradually, as they get older, they play different roles. They become soldiers and are given weapons at 10 to 12 years old, generally. And so this, this dynamic of really little kids being involved in gangs, and in fact, uh, very often the head of these gangs, which can control millions and millions of dollars worth of drug trafficking, are kids who are 16 years old. Um, so it's a... Uh, it's a tremendous situation. Uh, you got to think of it really as as little kids, uh, and it's it's pretty frightening to see to see to imagine twelve year olds with, uh, with big guns. But that's true. And I think it it also gives a sense of of why it's so significant in a world where um, people are really frightened of eight year old kids imagining that they might pull a gun on them. Why it's important for for kids of that age to be on the street dancing because it gives it a very different impression of, um, of what the life of a, of a kid, of a poor kid is going to be. Most of the evidence says that even in the most gang controlled neighborhoods, um, and that's an important category too, these are, these are places where the state has completely abandoned. There is no government, there's no police, there are no social services, there's no trash collection, there's no electricity. Um, provided by the state. And so these are places where if you want any of those things, the gang's going to do it. The gang's going to collect your trash. The gang is going to steal electricity from the, the city system in order to bring it to your house. The gang's going to steal internet to bring it to your house. Um, so they're very different relationships. It's not like, a, uh, it's not like the Latin Kings or the, the Crips or the Bloods in the United States. Uh, they are organizations that are almost like a government, but it controls a, a rather limited area. Um, and like I said, a, a government that is that has uh, little kids as as functionaries. Um, coming towards the end, you said that hip hop isn't a religious movement, and in one of my classes, we learned a little bit about liberation theology. And my professor pointed out that there were times, kind of even in Brazil, where it became so politicized that people had to kind of turn outside of the parish in order to find like, spirituality. So you saw a lot of converts. So do you worry that hip hop might kind of replace religion to the extent that people have to start turning outside of that too to find kind of more of a spiritual source? I think the, the threat to religiosity in, in contemporary Brazil or anywhere in Latin America is not hip hop. In fact, there are a lot of the kids that we would work with were involved both in Protestant groups and in Catholic groups. I think that much more of a threat, particularly to Catholicism, is the Catholic hierarchy. Um, when liberation theology was present, it opened a tremendous space for lots of people. Uh, and was a, was a great evangelical movement in the sense that it, it brought people from all sorts of places and got people excited about religion in a way that hadn't been true for a long time now. But as that space is closed, um, it really, it makes, especially uh, Catholicism, seem very frightening to a lot of people. The other thing that's a real threat to Catholicism in Brazil are Pentecostal kind of movements. Um, it's not going to be long until Brazil is a minority, until Catholicism is a minority religion in Brazil, largely because um, of these Pentecostal evangelical movements, which are tremendously powerful and in some cases are more tolerant of things like uh, of, of, uh, of outside traditions, and in some cases are less. But because they bring in culture, uh, are pretty, make people enthusiastic about religion. Well. Um, so I mean, obviously in a lot of your, uh, your lectures you mentioned the, you know, the really dangerous conditions, and I don't really, I'm not quite sure like how, you know, Far you've gone into the you know favelas, and I was just kind of wondering, just a little bit of a uh, question: Have you ever had you know experience you know a very you know dangerous and you know near death situation, possibly being like you know caught in some sort of conflict, and did that change your perspective at all, or change your attitude towards what you were doing? When I was in Medellin in 2002, it was the the time when 
more or less the last great urban war in many people, where the paramilitaries were trying to take over the city from the guerrillas. And the house that I was staying in, which was sort of a friend's house, every night we had to hide between behind two concrete walls because there were bullets <coughs> hitting the front of the house. Does that change one's perspective? Um, No. I mean, clearly, it's, it makes you think. It, um, stories are really important as, as a way to elaborate violence. And I think that those sorts of stories give one a, a motivation to do something. That when you see, wow, I'm here for five days and I'm seeing this. What's it like to grow up in the middle of this? What's it like to be a three-year-old? who can't play in the street after 5 o'clock because everyone knows that that's when the, the battle is going to happen. So, I'm not sure that it motivated me to do anything different. I'm not sure that it uh, scared me or anything like that, but, but it does give a much better sense of the panic, and the really legitimate panic that goes on when, uh, when you're growing up in a situation like that. And, and thank you very concretely. Wow, what would it? Have, what what would I be like if I were four years old and I experienced that? If for my entire life I had had bullets hitting the front of my house every night, what would I be like at twelve? Would it make sense for me to take up a gun? Yeah, maybe. Um, it probably to a certain degree it makes you more furious about the injustice of the world. And to a certain degree, it makes you understand a little bit better why it is that people do bad things. You think about uh, that same four-year-old kid who, at that point, uh, his mother happens to have to work um, late. She's a maid. She's coming back at 6 o'clock and can't make it back at 5 o'clock, in spite of the fact that everybody knows that at, uh, at 5 o'clock there's going to be a battle. And she's killed for that reason. What's that experience of a kid who grows up without his mom? thinking about vengeance, about trying to get anything, about trying to um, buy a refrigerator for the aunt who raised him in the middle of all of that, and thinking that drugs are the only, selling drugs is the only way that that's going to happen. So I guess to a certain degree it makes you more intolerant of injustice, and at the same time a little bit more understanding of, uh, of why people make choices that cause that injustice. Does, does that answer your question? I, it, it, it's, um, it's not a simple thing to think about. Um, okay, you mentioned how there was the rap concert and it was all sort of made we brought everyone together. I just want to know how you went about doing that. There's a, a cool tradition in the city of Hasifi, which is called um, the Nega, a black Tuesday, more or less. And when the, the socialist government came to power in the city, one of the things that they did culturally is that they put up a huge stage and a great sound system in the middle of the city and said, anybody, on Tuesday at evening, anybody can come and perform. That this is a way to overcome segregation. And because it's Black Tuesday, it's mostly for uh, black performers to come into the center of the city. So there's a long tradition of this happening. Um, it's, also done, it's also been built up with small businesses. Uh, it happens in, a, in a, an old colonial square, and all around the square are bars and restaurants. People come and they eat there, and then they listen to the show. Fortunately, because we were working with this great composer, uh, DJ B is his name, he knew all of the, the ways to publicize things. He's a, he's a great DJ and does big parties, and so knew how to use radio and television and print media in order to and that's important. I mean, the issues around public relations and, uh, and promoting are things that I'm not particularly good at. And if we would have done all of these wonderful things and the kids would have learned all these, uh, all these skills and, and developed a, a great language in which to condemn justice, and they get there and nobody's there to listen, the impact is much less, right? And so in that particular case, we were really fortunate to be able to work with, uh, with somebody who knew how to do promotions. And it was great. It's not an exaggeration to say there were three or five thousand people there. It was huge. Um, hello. Um, I'm from Colombia, South yeah. America. And um, I was just wondering, like,
side, do you think that the um, what you did with hip hop in Brazil, I'm not sure in what other countries this is occurring, but I was wondering if like you think that you could apply that to other countries and other places where there's also drug gangs like in Colombia and like help to bring about social change through hip hop. I think that we can help that in certain ways. But in fact, hip hop as a movement is one of the great things about hip hop is that it doesn't require somebody to come in from outside in order to do it. As a general rule, kids are so excited about it uh, that they learn to do the beatbox themselves, they learn to break dance themselves, they get DVDs of, of people break dancing and learn how to do all these things. And so I think that we probably jump started things in a certain way. And as the question was here, we did a really good job of publicizing it. But the basics are already there. Um, in, in, in Bogota, in, uh, in Casuca, in the south of the city, there's a spectacular hip hop movement. Um, really brilliant. And in the midst of conditions of violence that are similar to what I'm talking about, where paramilitaries control the neighborhood. But at the same time, hip hop is one of the very few ways that people are able to speak out against the gangs. Because the gangs listen to hip hop, they think it's cool. If you were to, to um, just write a newspaper condemning the paramilitaries in, in Casuca in Colombia or in lots of places, they'd come and kill you. But if you compose a rap saying exactly the same thing but with a good beat, they're not going to kill you. In fact, they're going to dance to it. But there's a really interesting irony that goes on there. Um, Kali, there's a, a great rapper named Carlos Way in, in Kali. Uh, so, I guess the answer is that, uh, to a certain degree, it's already been done. That people are already doing these sorts of things. You just have to pay attention to where it is. And, and secondly, that what somebody from outside is able to do is to be able to modify it in certain ways, to promote it, to give it more impact. Um, to, uh, I recorded a hip-hop album for, um, for two Colombian kids in 2004. And great rappers. But they would have never had the opportunity to record a hip hop album had I not been there. So I think that those are the sorts of resources that are brought are, are making it possible for more people to receive that impact. Not just because two kids are rapping on the corner in a poor neighborhood, but because they can also get on the radio, because they can also get international attention. Um, that's, I think that's the, the, the power of that that synergy between something international and something local. The creativity of, of local kids in Casuca or in uh, Popular, Popular Dos in Medellin or something like that, having the chance to, uh, to have their voices heard at a much greater level. But Colombian hip hop right now is awesome. It's really good. Uh, last year in Colombia, we did uh, three major projects. One of them was with a group of ex-child soldiers. Uh, did people hear the question? She asked if the organization was doing anything else in Colombia. And last year, we worked with uh, a group of ex-child soldiers who created a, a full-length fictional movie based on their lives, but using the life of the urban underworld as a sort of metaphor for the experience of war. Uh, we also did a, a project with the Saliba Indians in uh, Casanare. Um, where they documented the history of their tribe with video and uh, did a really interesting project with a group of, uh, of refugee children who, um, who learned how to make documentary films and then documented what was good about their neighborhoods in spite of the fact that they're refugee neighborhoods. What were the things that, uh, that are good and can be contributed from? Should we take well, one or two more questions and then... Anything. I can think of some. <laughs> <laughs>